Hallelujah. Let's stand up and worship the Lord. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Kiddos, let's see those palms. Let's see those palms. I love it. <laughs> All right, adults, let's see those palms. It's the same joke every year. <laughs> and it does not get old. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Georgetown Christian Fellowship. Let's offer up a quick prayer and jump right back in singing songs to Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for these times that we gather together and worship you and just be together and hear from you. Lord, I pray for this service for your hand of blessing. And we just, Lord, we receive your goodness as we also just turn our hearts and our minds and our voices to you and all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to jesus have
Happy Palm Sunday, triumphal entry day to you all. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about the second message of Palm Sunday. I think there's an overlooked message that happens after the triumphal entry, and I went back and I looked at my notes, and it's been like 14 years since I talked about this, and so it's, it's due. But then as I was working through some things, um, the Lord kind of opened up some other stuff that I want to talk about today, too, that I think He wants to talk about today. So we're going to start off by celebrating Palm Sunday. So uh, all four Gospels record this Palm Sunday celebration, this triumphal entry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so, <clears throat> probably a familiar story to some, but let's just review it a quick minute, because I actually want to talk about what happens after the triumphal entry. So, we're just going to read through this, if you're in your Bible, or you can follow me here. This is uh, Matthew 21, 1 through 11. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. This is also going to be on the last slide of today, so keep note of this. The disciple went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them on, their, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread out their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. There's your Palm Sunday message. But just after this, in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's another event that is recorded. And this event apparently had some significance because three out of the four Gospels mention it. It's interesting, though. If you look, it's just 12 and 13, 15 through 18, 45 and 46. It's just two to four verses. It's not that much, but it happened enough and was significant enough that they decided it should be put in. Mark eleven eighteen. This was the response to this event. This event happened, and it says, And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Now, as if the triumphal entry wasn't enough to disrupt, you think about it. Jesus is not a part of the religious ruling class. He's not been accepted as a bona fide rabbi by the religious elite. Nonetheless, the people love him. The ruling class, the religious ruling class, were also in cahoots with the Romans, the Herodians, the Roman uh, leadership, to try to keep things the status quo. And Jesus was definitely unquoting the status or whatever. He was definitely disrupting the status quo. So he was sometimes in their face, sometimes not. But at this point, the people wanted to make Jesus king. That means Jesus is drawing power, influence, control away from the religious elite ruling class. And that's, what do we say? 
They feared him. And what do you do when you fear something? You want to destroy it, right? He was upsetting things. So what happened that they wanted to kill him? Not the triumphal entry, the thing that happened afterwards. Well, we're going to pick it up in Mark. Right after this was the purging of the temple. In Mark eleven fifteen, and let's let me be transparent about something. Matthew and Luke, as the Gospels read, it says the triumphal entry happened and Jesus went to the temple and we pick up. Mark says it happened the next day. Same story, timing's a little different. We're going to pick it up in Mark because I like the fullness of how he describes it. It says they, so that's Jesus and the disciples, came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. The people are calling for Jesus to be king, to overthrow the Roman government. He walks straight into the temple where the ruling elite religious leaders are, and he starts tossing tables. It's within the realm of possibility for a believer, maybe. I don't know. He is now absolutely disrupting what's going on. Before, he was a little subversive. Now he's absolutely disrupting and he was teaching them. <laughs> I love the fact, I have to just say, as a, as a teacher, I love the fact. He's flipping tables, and he's teaching them. <laughs> like, he's not yelling at them. He's like, this is, what, this is what the scripture says. Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests heard that teaching and sought a way to destroy him. So let's just talk about, we're going to drill down a ton. So you're, you're like, Tim, are you actually going to talk for 30 or 40 minutes on two verses, four verses? Yes, we are. Because today we're going to do a Bible study. So there's t- a couple of things. I'm going to give you a little insight. This is a, I don't say great. This is a great way to do Bible study. One way of many We're going to talk about a house of prayer, and we're going to talk about a den of robbers, because Jesus is quoting the Old Testament, and we're going to drill down into those Old Testament prophecies. But let's talk about the structure. So let's unpack this story of the purging of the temple. So we've got to get a visual. How many of you are visual learners? I have to see it in order to really like get it, right? And so there was kind of two, two big partitions of this temple concept. So first of all, get this picture in your head. There is the the temple itself, the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant would be, where the law was. And so this area here was only where the high priest could go. There was an, an inner court or the holy place, and you had altars, the uh, sea or the basin, and then places where you could do the sacrifices And so the Levites, the priests, were in here doing work. They were slaughtering animals and doing the sacrifices. Then there was another courtyard here called the woman's courtyard, and there were other areas to keep oil. There were places for the Nazarites. There was a chamber for wood, and there was actually a chamber for lepers, which I think is very interesting. So there's this temple proper with the Holy of Holies here, and it's gated in. Now from there, so here's the temple with the gates, there's the Holy of Holies in here, but then there's this outer courtyard. This is where the Gentiles were allowed. There were very specific Old Testament laws about who was allowed in this courtyard, and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. But if you were unclean, if you were a Gentile, if you had stuff wrong with your body, you could not go into the temple, but you could hang out out here on the outside. You could still be a part of the festivities. You could still be parts of the feasts. You just couldn't step foot in here because you were unclean. Does that make sense? But it didn't exclude you. You just had to be out here. 
So these are, um, I was reading this picture, this whole process right here is like in all the cities back here, this recreation is like an acre, it's huge. Um, and then here's another recreation, so different angle. So there were the courtyards of the Gentiles out here, and then sacrifices happening here. So everybody got a good picture of this? Got that in your head. So highly likely, it was these areas out here where all this merchandising, the selling and money changing was happening. Maybe it went all the way into the first courtyard. Let's continue to unpack. So how about this business that's happening in the temple? Where did this come from? Well, who was in charge of the temple mount at the time? The religious leaders, right? So they were either... Can I, can I say this? They were either skimming off the top of all that business. Sorry, I'm a little jaded about that politics, right? But they weren't forbidding it, that's for sure. So it was at least allowed. I think they were probably making money, and I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. But I think they were heavily involved in the merchandising that was happening. But how did this even start? Well, back in Deuteronomy... 14. This is part of the law. Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 27. It says, You shall tithe all of the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. Okay? So you got your field planted, you take off the tithe from that, you store it. And before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain and of your wine and of your oil and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Okay? So, you're going to take your tithe from your field, from your flock, from your wine. You're going to take it with you. You're going to put it on your wagon. And you're going to take it to the place that God will set his name at the temple. Now, depending on how things go, that might be a lot of stuff. That could be huge caravans full of tithe. If God's richly blessed you, you've got truckloads of things that you have to take to Jerusalem. That could be difficult. And God, even though there are so many Old Testament laws, he doesn't want to make it that hard for the people to worship him. And so he says, if the way is too long for you so that you're not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn all of your stuff into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that the Lord your God chooses and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves. Because it's easier to transport a couple of cases of cash than it is to transport truckloads of stuff, right? And God's like, you got to bring the tithes and offerings. This is what we do. You need to fear the Lord. You need to obey. But I'll make it easy for you to obey. You can just turn it into cash and come to Jerusalem. And then you can spend it. And get this, you get to spend your tithe and offering on doing what? celebrating. You get to eat. You shall eat it there before the Lord your God and rejoice. You and your household, it's a party at the temple saying, God, look what you've done to us. Look what you've done for us and all of this stuff. And we get to eat with you. And then it says, and you shall not neglect the Levite within your town for he has no portion or inheritance with you. I sort of think you were supposed to bring the Levite from your town with you and say, hey, bro, you don't get land according to the law. You don't get to work the fields. You're going to come with us, and we're going to celebrate and feast together. We want you to be a part of what we're doing. And so even those that did not have stuff were allowed to come and rejoice and feast and celebrate. Does that make sense? I find it interesting a lot of times in the Old Testament when the sacrifice, like the, the big... Um, burnt offering was supposed to be a bull or a ram, that's a pretty heavy price. That's, that's expensive. 
But then it says, if you can't afford that, you can, you can do a ram or a sheep. And if you can't afford that, you can do a dove or a pigeon. God was making a way for people to get right with him, even if you couldn't afford it. God was setting law and saying, you have to be right. There is a sacrifice. But I get it. We're not all on the same playing field, and I want to make a way for you to get right. And so even in this, God's law, his intention is liberty. The intention is, I want you guys to celebrate with me, and here's how to make it easy for you. Does that make sense? So over the years and years and years, Israelites are now coming to the temple and have to turn that cash into food so that they can celebrate. And I think somewhere along the line, somebody said, yeah, we can make a profit off of that. I bet we could do that. As a matter of fact, let's do that right here in the temple and we'll just skim off of all this business. Not to mention the fact that there's money changers. People are coming from all over all over the diaspora. They're coming from all over and they're bringing their local currency into Jerusalem. And so now you have to be able to change that into local currency to be able to buy stuff. And you know those money changers? They're skimming off the top. There's a fee to make that happen. And so what God initially meant for liberty, for celebration, for feasting with him turns into big business. What was meant for rejoicing now becomes a burden to the people. You were supposed to come and be able to give everything to God and enjoy the feast, and now part of that has been taken away from you and gone to the leaders. Jesus called them a den of thieves, and I think there was probably a respectable amount of extortion going on with all of that. So instead of celebrating at the temple, now the politicians, the religious leaders were taking it from you, and you couldn't celebrate as fully as you were supposed to. Not good. So let's unpack this a little bit further. This is kind of where some of these feelings about this come from. Jesus said, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer. But you've made it a den of robbers. Where was he quoting from? It was Isaiah 56, 7. It says, these I will bring into my holy mountain and make them, what? Joyful, not burdened, not extorted, I will bring them in and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for just the Jews? No, for all peoples. Wherever you're from, you get to come. There are certainly laws. You're not allowed to go into the temple itself, but you can be a part if you want to join in, you can join in. So, if you got your Bible apps out, or your Bibles out, I want you to go to Isaiah 56, because we're going to spend some time in here. I'm going to put this stuff on the screen, but it's nice to get it all in one, one way, too. So, who are these? It says, these I will bring into my house. So, we have to define who are these. And the preceding verses will tell us who these are. Isaiah 56, oh listen, I hear, I hear Bibles turning, that's good. Isaiah 56, 3 through 6. God says through Isaiah, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. He's saying, don't, don't say that, you foreigner. If you're going to come and join yourself to me, you're not going to be separated. I'm going to accept you. And this says, let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. I'm going to be a little... So a eunuch is somebody who has been 
surgically castrated, they've had their sexual organs damaged, okay? And Old Testament law is very clear that that body mutilation is not allowed in the temple. It's an uncleanness. And so if you had that happen to you, and it's very often if you got taken as a slave or a servant, that happened to you involuntarily. And so the eunuch who's already been abused and damaged now can't go to the temple and celebrate with the Lord? God's saying, no, don't, don't think that. For thus says the Lord to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath, right? You're joined to me. You want to be a part of what's going on. Who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant. I know you've been damaged, in the past. But you're choosing me and you're choosing to join my covenant. You're choosing to keep the Sabbath. You're choosing to identify with Yahweh. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. You get to be a part of my family. And I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to Yahweh, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, you people who would normally be excluded and can't join, God says, no, you get to join I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to make you part of my family. These are the ones that I'm going to bring to my holy mountain. People who would be ostracized, people who would be on the outs, who would not be allowed, God's saying, no. Not if you've joined yourself to me. You get to be a part of my family. This is huge news. This is a new this is a message of belonging, of bringing in, of not rejection. You get to be a part of what's happening here. If you join to me, this is good news. These I will bring to my holy mountain. And I will make them joyful where their lives have not been joyful before. And their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called the house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him. (laughs) It's interesting that it says him. To who? Who are they gathering to? To him. There's a him. We know who that him is. But it's interesting, it tucks right in there. I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. So where were those people going to be? We talked about this. They were going to be in those outer courts celebrating in the court of the Gentiles. But what was happening out here now? That's where all the merchandising was happening. This is where they were buying and selling, trading, money changing. This big religious business was standing in the way of the people who God was accepting in for his worship. Does that make sense? Are you getting that? Big business was hindering people's ability to come and worship. I think Jesus walked into that place, was not happy, was not happy that the money was getting in the way of worship. Amen? It's interesting I have just a side note. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 4, about the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, 
they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move a, move, help them with even a finger. So this first half of Isaiah 56, before verse 7 and 8, is a message of belonging, of bringing in. But the chapter doesn't stop there if you're reading ahead already. It goes on. All you beasts of the field, come and devour. All you beasts of the forest, his watchmen. Who? His watchmen? Who are those going to be? The chief priests, the teachers of the law. The people who are supposed to be watching over the people. His watchmen are blind. They are all without knowledge. They are silent dogs. They cannot bark, dreaming and lying down, loving to slumber, but they still have a mighty appetite. They never have enough, but they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each to his own gain, one and all. Come, they say, let us get wine, let's fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow we'll, bu- and tomorrow we'll be like this day. Great beyond measure. I've used this analogy before. But if something goes really well, somebody performs really well, and I say, and I say to you, man, you just hit that out of the park. Do you know what I'm referring to? Right? Hit that out of the park. That's a baseball reference. That's a home run. Like you just creamed it, right? And so all I have to say is, man, you hit that out of the park, and everybody has a visual in their head about what that just meant. Well, if you're a religious leader, a teacher of the law, and Jesus says, a house of prayer for all nations, your brain goes, oh, oh, wait, what? Because in their mind, they went, house of prayer for all nations, and blah, 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 blah. And you beasts of the field, and you watchmen are blind. Wait, is he calling me blind? Silent dogs that don't bark, who but have still appetites. Your shepherds, who have no understanding, and you turn to your own. Is he, say, is he saying that about me? Yes, that's what he's doing right then and there. Slanderous. Scathing. So in one prophecy, in one line, a few words, Jesus is saying to the the people and to the religious leaders, I want to draw you in. This is you. I want you to be part of my family. And you guys over here, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it. They heard it. And were seeking a way to destroy him. Because that prophecy said that God's going to destroy them. Not cool. And they feared him because they had seen his miracles. They had seen the things he had done. He is teaching, not just teaching with words, but teaching with power and with signs and wonders. And so when he's quoting prophets, quoting Isaiah, and calling down the beasts of the field to come devour, that probably meant something to them. They heard it and were seeking a way to destroy. What about this den of robbers? Do you think it gets any better? That den of robbers comes from Jeremiah 7.11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Now, I fully 100% believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. I do wonder when he quotes this and says, Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. I wonder if the chief priests are like, Wait a minute. Is he equating himself with God? He might have been. He might have been. Okay, so that's the 11th verse. Where do we go from here? We got to go up. Jeremiah 3.10, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds. 
and I will let you dwell in this place. What place? It says so. Do not trust these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. We're fine. It's all good. It's not all good. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another and do not oppress the sojourner, this is why I think that the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the ruling elite religious class were extorting the people. They were skimming off the top. They were being oppressive. Jesus is quoting out of Jeremiah saying, you are oppressing all of these travelers that are coming to you to come into the city. And the fatherless or the widow and shedding innocent blood in this place. And if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, the temple in the land that I gave of, your, of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come, and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we're delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations. It paints this picture that they were committing all of these heinous acts, coming into the temple, making their sacrifices, saying, hey, we're good, this is the temple, we're all good, and then just go right back on to doing those things again. God's saying, that's, that's not the right thing. Do you have to amend your ways? It's interesting, I think, Paul kind of reflects this in Romans. He says in Romans 6, 1 through 4, well, then, should we keep on sinning so that grace, so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ, and Jesus, Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. Shall we keep on sinning? Shall we keep on doing? Shall we just go, oh yeah, Jesus will forgive my sins and then I'm good, and then just go right back to what we were doing? The parallel between the Old and New Testament here speaks for itself. We should not. And then we get to verse 11. God says, I see what you're doing. You have made my house, which is called by my name, a den of robbers. I've seen it for myself. And then, of course, there's the after. And we won't, if you really want to get into it, just go read the whole rest of Jeremiah 7. But we'll just pick out these two verses. It says, therefore, because the, they were trusting in the temple, therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name and in which you trust and to the place that I gave you and to your fathers as I did to Shiloh. What did he do? Wiped it out. And I will cast you out of my sight as I cast out all of your kinsmen and all the offspring of Ephraim. God is saying your practices are detestable. These are inappropriate, unproductive, sinful, abominations. And you trust in the temple thinking that you're good when you're not good, and so I'm going to take away the thing that you're trusting. And in 70 AD, what happened? The Romans had had enough. They were already occupying Judea as it was, and then there was another insurrection, and they just like, we're done with you all, and pulled the temple down. And it's not been rebuilt since.
and the chief priests and the scribes, they heard it. They heard it and were seeking for a way to destroy him, for they feared him. It's just a couple of two to four verses in the Gospels. Do you see the depth and the richness of what actually happened at that moment? How the chief priests and the scribes in that moment understood what he was saying. They knew what was going on. So some final thoughts for this second message. What we just walked through was taking some New Testament scripture, particularly out of the Gospels, particularly what Jesus said, and linking it back to the Old Testament. Because we never want to forget that Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. Right? I follow a Jewish Messiah. And if I want to understand, I can read through the Gospels or the New Testament and get a lot out of it. There's plenty there to live off of. But if you go back and marry that to the Old Testament, the First Testament, there's so much more depth and so much more richness that you can get into as well. Especially, <laughs> this is not the only time where it says the this chief priest, the teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees sought to kill Jesus. It's multiple times throughout the Gospels. And so you want a, a fun little study, go do that. So it says in Mark 12, 14 and, or Matthew 12, 14 and Mark 3 through 6, and they sought a way to kill Jesus. So go back and look at what he said, and then get your cross-references out and see if you can find stuff in the Old Testament and see what he said, actually said to them. You know it wasn't pleasant. So here's your homework. So in the triumphal entry of Palm Sunday, Zechariah 9, 9 is quoted, greatly rejoice, rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem, uh, sorry, shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. So let me ask you, do you think it's really, really important that Jesus was riding on a donkey? Yeah, it actually was. Very good. Very good. Why? What? Go ahead. Yeah. She did exactly. That's true. That's true. Why else was it important? Anybody else? It fulfilled prophecy. What else? So, the Old Testament law, actually God told the Israelites that they were not allowed to have horses, that they were only allowed to have donkeys because horses were weapons of war. And God said, I don't want you, don't want you trusting in horses and chariots. You trust in me. And so you get to, you get to have donkeys and they were they were beasts of peace. They were beasts of agriculture. They were helpful. Did you know that? Yeah. You know? So there's a lot to just the donkey part. Right? So go back to the Old Testament and look up donkey. <laughs> Find those laws, right? The palm fronds, where do those come from? There's all sorts of richness when you peel that back. But particularly, if you read Zechariah chapter 9, and I want you to do this, but I want you to not read it as an American in 2024. Well, you almost could, but not quite. I want you to read it as if you were a Jew living in Judea, under Roman occupation in which Roman soldiers were walking down your streets every day, in which Roman soldiers could grab you and say, my pack is too heavy, 
you're going to carry my backpack for a mile. And you had to interrupt your entire day. It didn't, doesn't matter what was going on with you. You had to carry that backpack for a mile. And then you had to walk back to whatever you were doing. That kind of occupation where you got taxed and taxed and taxed. Oh, I guess we kind of do have that. Okay, so sort of like an American. But we don't have soldiers rolling down the streets yet. But read Zechariah chapter 9 as if you're a Jew living in Judea with soldiers and taxes and oppression and you could just get stopped for no reason. Oh, wait, that's kind of... Never mind. Okay? That's your homework. Read Zechariah 9 in that context. The use of religious pomp and circumstance, fear, control, and manipulation to get rich is not new. Nor is it actually confined just to Christianity, to be honest. That's not for us, folks. As Jesus followers, as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. It's actually right now. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, you freely give. Okay? As a Jesus follower, you're allowed to be rich. It's okay. You're also allowed to be poor. That's okay. But don't use your discipleship as a Jesus follower as a manipulation, control, fear, pomp, circumstance to get you rich. Amen. That's not your job. Your job is to trust the Lord for your sustenance, for your daily bread. Amen? Okay. Okay. Last thought, and I kind of talked about this, but it's just something for us to consider. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to idols, serve other idols, serve things in your life that are not God, go, other, go after other gods, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we're delivered only to go on doing all those abominations? Do we want to be like those chief priests and scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law? I don't, I don't think so. Maybe we should consider that a little more closely. Amen? Okay. That's a heavy final thought. But it kind of hit me as I was looking at it. I'm like, yeah, we should probably think about that as a final thought. So you have some homework. Go read Zechariah chapter 9. Let's not be scribes and Pharisees, teachers of the law. Let's give freely what we've been given. And if you feel like you're running out, go ask the Lord who gives freely without upbraiding, without chiding, without chastising. Let the Holy Spirit fill your heart and fill your life and then give that. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. Lord, we do understand. Lord, that we have sinned. We have done things that your word calls sin. Sometimes we even go back to it. And that it shouldn't be so. We should be living in a new life in you. So Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name, first and foremost, we just fall at the foot of the cross, repent of our sins. Lord, we confess them before you. If you're thinking about that thing right now, don't tell me, tell him. Lord, that thing, struggling with it. Lord, in Jesus' name, I just Pray that your spirit would fill, your spirit would fill each of us right now. 
to renew us, to strengthen us, to walk humbly before you, walk rightly before you in the power of the Spirit. Lord, that you would heal our hearts from past hurts that may be, that may be triggering some of those bad behaviors. Lord, you do all of it. You heal our hearts. You pour in the oil on the wine, the kind that restores our soul. You bind up the brokenhearted. Lord, heal those hearts. Help us to walk rightly before you. Lord, help us to walk justly, to not be the oppressor, but to treat everyone well. Lord, to prefer one another. Help us to walk as good disciples and to give this world of what we've been given. Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins, that if we confess our sins, that you are, you are faithful and just. And we'll forgive our sins and cleanse us from that unrighteousness. And Lord, if you are faithful and just, Lord, help us by your spirit to also be faithful and just as an expression of who you are to others. Lord, and finally, just spur our hearts to dig deep into your word, to see the richness and the vastness, the depth of what you have in store for those who are joined to you, who have joined themselves to you. Lord, we join ourselves to you in your covenant under Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name and we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Church. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server and install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capability. 